All right, <clears throat> this is analytical chemistry. And in this class, this semester, we're going to be using uh, this online textbook. Uh, this online textbook is uh, helpful for a couple of reasons. One, it's available to everybody, so it's really cheap. And two, uh, using online texts is kind of uh, the way things are moving, the direction things are going in terms of um, I'm teaching, teaching and learning, and especially during this type of uh, pandemic, right? So um, let's start going through this book little by little, and um, we'll try to learn together about what analytical chemistry is and uh, what is expected in this class, all right? The first thing I want to do is introduce you to a, a friend of mine that's going to help me, uh, hopefully help both of us, understand this um, course and this material a little bit better, okay? Um, this is Fred, all right? So Fred here is going to act as a student and try to ask questions and also answer questions from a student's perspective. And the goal is that um, by doing this, um, We'll all be able to teach to somebody. It'll make us both feel a little more comfortable. I think initially you as a student will say, well, that's weird. What's going on there? But gradually you'll just see him as another student asking the types of questions that a student who has already gone through general chemistry and maybe a little bit of organic or a little bit of bio, uh, biochemistry, uh, he has that sort of uh, perspective. And so he hopefully will ask those types of questions. Okay. How's that sound, Fred? Oh, that's okay. Sounds good to me. All right. Excellent. So let's take a look at this stuff here, Fred, and see uh, what you know. Okay. So in this first chapter here, or first section, Introduction to Analytical Chemistry, um, we talked about what analytical chemistry is, um, some, the perspective of analytical chemistry. Um, you know, many analytical chemists describe the perspective as an analytical approach to solving problems. Analytical chemistry, though, isn't just um, one branch of chemistry. It's really a way to think and apply all different branches of chemistry. So you can say that you're analytical about organic or analytical about your perspective to biochemistry. Uh, some people might want to argue that analytical is um, its own branch. and There's certain specific things that you study, but I think that's a tough argument to make. Okay. Um, we'll talk about uh, the perspective on problems, different chemical analytical problems that we would be able to to solve, right? Okay, very good. So let's start off here with uh, what is analytical chemistry? Like I said, um, all areas of chemistry can be analytical to an effect, right? Um, it's the area of chemistry responsible for uh, characterizing matter, both qualitatively and quantitatively, okay? Now, qualitatively means, is there something bad in the sample? Like, is there lead there? Quantitatively refers to how much of the bad there is or how much lead is there in that paint, okay? And surely, if you've taken analytical or uh, general chemistry, you've done some quantitative work in determining the concentration of uh, vinegar, for example, maybe, or concentration of sodium bicarbonate, or even determining the concentration of, of copper sulfate in solutions. These are all things that, that have been done. Do you remember doing that, Fred? Fred? Yeah, I did that. Which one did you do? Uh, we Didn't we in 105 lab do copper sulfate? That's right. What do you mean when you said we did copper sulfate? Uh, well, I can't remember. Well, do you remember that you had the uh, solutions of copper sulfate and you used a spectrophotometer. Do you remember that? Using the spectrophotometer to uh, plot the concentration of copper sulfate versus how much light was absorbed. Yeah, I remember that. And then we got a, a plot. We used Beer's Law. That's right. Very good. Beer's Law. So let's, let's look, uh, re remind ourselves of that uh, a little bit more, right? So uh, we had uh, a solution of copper sulfate. Right, so here's my copper sulfate. And um, <clears throat> it was actually, to start off, it was a, a known solution of copper sulfate, right? 
and we took that known solution of copper sulfate and we um, made ourselves dilution. So this started off at 0 0.1 molar copper sulfate. Do you remember that? Well, not exactly, but I understand what you're talking about. Okay, whoops, let's clean this up a little bit. And there we go. That was the initial concentration, if you remember. And then we uh, made dilutions. And I think that we made, usually in, in most of the courses, we just make the dilutions right in our little cuvette. Do you remember that? Oh, I remember those cuvettes, yeah. Okay, so if we put 0.1 molar into one, I'll put 0.1 molar to remind us the concentration. And then we made various dilutions um, of 0 0.08 molar, 0 0.06 molar, right? 0 0.04 molar. Right. And we kept doing this until we got down to, uh, you know, a, a, what we called a blank, a blank. Right. Which is no copper sulfate in it. Right. Yeah, I remember that. And then do you remember also we had a, um, a spectrophotometer. It looks something like this. Right. And it said something like spectroviz and had a little rainbow color or something. So. So these cuvettes would fit into this slot right here, the sample slot, and um, light would shine through the cuvettes, right? There would be a, a, a light um, source inside um, the spectrophotometer, and um, then we would have this connected to a computer, and we would see a readout that uh, showed us what we call absorbance, absorbance, and that absorbance was plotted versus wavelength, wavelength, right? Do you remember what wavelength is pertaining to? What were they talking about when they say wavelength? Oh, uh, wavelength. Um, so light has different wavelengths. Very good. Do you remember what the, um, um, the wave's length, the, the length of visible light is? Uh... Is it a range? That's right, it's a range. So what is the range? Um, oh, I can't remember. All right, so this is very critical. And for any scientist, even if you're just going into the medical field, it's very important that you remember the um, range, the wavelength range. And it's from 400 to 700 nanometers. 400 to 700 nanometers. That's the range of uh, visible electromagnetic energy. Now, do you remember what uh, nanometers was referring to there? The wave's length. Very good. So if I have a, a photon of electromagnetic energy here, and this length right there is 700 nanometers, that means um, that is the wave's length. Good. Now, do you remember the colors of visible light? Yeah, the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple. Very good. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple. Now, do you remember... Um, there are other forms of electromagnetic energy, um, not just visible, right? Some of it, some of it doesn't excite the molecules in our eyes, right? Um, X-rays, radio waves, right? And radio waves, everything that transmits um, information through cell phones, through um, Wi-Fi, right? All of this is electromagnetic energy transmission. Um, do you remember what color the 700 nanometer? Well, the colors of the rainbow first. Let's start there. Oh, yeah. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple. Very good. So red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple, or violet. And um, what color relates to 700 nanometers? Um, I can't remember. All right. So this is something we always want to be able to remember, and we need to be able to, to uh, recall at any given moment. Um, I'll write down the, the colors here, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and I'll write down violet, all right? Um, how about, and this is just the, the visible spectra of the electromagnetic, of electromagnetic energy, what goes on this side of violet, do you know? Uh, what do you mean? Well, this range is from 400 to 700 nanometers, but there are wavelengths that are um, both smaller and bigger on both sides of this visible spectra, and they have some names that we should be familiar with, we probably are familiar with. Oh, you mean like ultraviolet? That's right, ultraviolet. Now, do you know which side of the visible spectra, I'll call this the visible spectra, do you know what side of the visible spectra is ultraviolet, or is ultraviolet on? Uh, 
Is it by violet? That's right. Very good. So because we have violet over here, ultraviolet's over there. What about the other side? What do we call this side? Uh, I don't know. It's IR. Do you know what that stands for? Oh, infrared. Very good. Infrared. So now the way we can remember which side 700 nanometers is, right? So, so here's the two ends of the visible spectra. One's 400, one's 700 nanometers. And we're trying to remind ourselves how we can always remember that because we want to always remember that. The way we can tell is um, remember what we know about UV and infrared spectroscopy, or sorry, uh, electromagnetic energy. Is, um, is one of these dangerous, UV or IR? Oh uh, yeah, UV. That's right, UV. What does UV, what do UV rays cause? Uh, burns, like some burns and stuff. Very good. In, in the lab, if you're exposed to UV light, you can get significant, uh, um, quickly and significantly burned, right? Like a really bad sunburn. Um, the sun also has an amount of UV radiation. So that's where we get sunburn. So we see that this region here is more energetic, higher in energy than this side over here. Have you ever heard of IR waves causing problems? Uh, I don't know that I can. Yeah. IR waves aren't ever uh, suggested to be issues associated with um, damage to tissue or, or damaged material or anything like that, okay? So, um, in terms of energy, we would say that this is higher energy, right? When this one is lower energy. Is that fair? Yeah, that's fair. Okay, good. So, we have higher energy and lower energy there. Now, um, how does that help with the with the wavelengths? Any ideas? Um, I remember that the wavelengths, it doesn't matter the wavelength, they all travel the same speed. That's a good, good memory to have. So let me show you a second photon of electromagnetic energy. This one I tried to make with the wavelength of the 400 nanometer, smaller than the 700, didn't quite succeed perfectly but it is a little bit shorter. If both of these started a race at this point and we wanted to see which one got to the end first, what did you say, which one would win? Well, they go the same speed. That's right, they go the same speed. That's the speed of light, electromagnetic energy, right? So, um, which one, 400 or 700, if they're both going the same speed as it travels across, which one is going up and down more frequently or which one has a higher frequency, right? That's what frequency is measuring how frequently it goes up and down. Oh, the 400 nanometer would have to go up and down one, two, three, four times, whereas the 700 only went three, or at least how you drew it. That's right, very good. So this one's going up and down more frequency. And frequency relates to energy. So the higher the frequency, the higher the energy. So which one has a higher frequency, violet or red? Higher energy is the UV region, so violet has the higher frequency. Good. So which one has the shorter wavelength, violet or red? Shorter wavelength? Um, I'm not sure. Well, see, this one here went up and down more frequently, but it had a shorter wavelength. This one here went up and down less frequently and had a longer wavelength. So we see that energy is inversely proportional to the wave's length but directly proportional to its frequency. Energy is never related to the speed because all electromagnetic energy travels at the same speed. Okay, so that tells us that what? What is our, our violet light? What is the wavelength for violet light? That must be 400. Very good, 400 nanometers. And this one over here then? 700. 700 nanometers. Excellent job, very good. A little reminder there about how our spectrophotometer works. Um, so we were monitoring the wavelengths from, I think it was about um, 400 here, and I think we went all the way up to the near IR called, or 900 nanometers called near IR, all right? And when we put one of these samples into the sample holder, um, we would get a signal and a peak where the electromagnetic energy was absorbed. Now, do you remember the color of copper sulfate? Uh, it was blue. Very good. And I'm going to write that down there for us. It was blue. <clears throat> 
400 nanometers here. What color is the light that's 400 nanometers long? Uh, it's violet. Very good. So violet, and I'll put red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. All right. Corresponding, actually red would be right about here around 700, right? <clears throat> but the important thing here is to recognize that these are the wavelengths that are high in energy and these are the ones that are low in energy, okay? So, <clears throat> if our um, absorbance was like this, it means that this material here, which was a blue color, this solution was absorbing light at this wavelength, right? It was not absorbing light at the blue, correct? It was absorbing down here. Um, so why is it blue? Well, you don't see what's being absorbed. You see what's not being absorbed. Very good. You see the blue color here because that color was not absorbed and something somewhere else in the spectra was being absorbed. And so it augments the, the, the wavelengths of energy that were not absorbed because the other ones are, are pulled out more. All right. Now, as I change my concentration from 0 0.01 or 0 0.1, to 0 0.08, 0 0.06, 0 0.00, this was, let's say this is 0 0.04. All right, so I went down in concentration. How did the color change? Oh, it got lighter and lighter. Very good. That's right. Blank was lighter and lighter. And we use our blank, right, to tell the spectrophotometer um, what it looks like without any material, without any electromagnetic energy being absorbed. And then we put in these various colors. And when you put in various colors, you get different um, amounts of absorption depending on the concentration, right? <clears throat> and then you can choose what we call the lambda max. So I'll write that a little bit better, lambda max. Now, why is it called lambda max? Any ideas? Uh, what is lambda? Lambda is the um, Greek letter L for length or wavelength. So lambda means the wave's length. And the lambda max is the wavelength that it was absorbed the maximum, the most, the most. And if I plot the absorbance of my lambda max versus, whoops, that's not very good, versus the concentration of my copper sulfate, for example, all right, then I can get a, a linear relationship and an equation. Right? And that is called a standard curve, right? And when you have a standard curve, then you're reaching into the realms of quantitative analytical chemistry as opposed to qualitative. Because just the presence of the blue is an indication of whether or not it's, um, it, whether or not it's there right, whether or not you have copper sulfate there. And you could also qualify it by identifying that the wavelength is correct, appropriate wavelength. But the ability here to relate concentration, or sorry, absorbance to concentration, then gives us the ability to identify, and this is what we did in, in the lab, right? We took um, an unknown. So this is an unknown concentration of copper sulfate. We could put it into the spectrophotometer, watch the absorption, and at the lambda max, find out what that absorption was, and then relate that with our equation here to the, the concentration of the copper sulfate. Do you remember that lab? Oh, it's, it's coming back to me, I think. Very good. It's an important fundamental lab to make sure we understand that we had an experience with uh, quantifying, quali or quantifying using quantitative analysis to determine the concentration of, of, of an unknown, copper sulfate in an unknown. Okay, good. All right, so let's turn back to the text here. This is an interesting paragraph. Defining analytical chemistry as the application of chemical knowledge ignores the unique perspective that an analytical chemist brings to the study of chemistry. The craft of analytical chemistry is not found in performing a routine analysis, all right? And, and that's true. If you get a job uh, as a bachelor with a bachelor's degree or with a, um, a high school degree in, a, in some place, 
performing what we call just, you know, uh, chemical analysis, where you are given the kit, you are given the, the, the assay and the instructions, and you just perform whatever somebody else has developed. That's not quite analytical chemistry. Analytical chemistry is the improving of the established method or um, extending some analytical method to, to different sample types or improving it somehow. Um, so so there, there's a, a, a significant distinction there, okay? Okay, so you could think of um, a chemical or an analytical method, an analytical method, right? Um, as having kind of different stages or steps that it has to go through before it becomes useful. Um, the concept, identifying a concept, thinking of, of, a, of a new way to make an analysis or a, a way to analyze something that hasn't previously been analyzed or improving upon it, you know, less expensive, faster, whatever it is. Um, we have to demonstrate that the method works. We have to um, establish its capabilities, right? Just because it works doesn't mean it's going to work under every condition, and it doesn't mean it's going to work under, under every concentration, right? Um, and then we try to spread the use, acceptance of the analytical method. Now, widespread, widespread acceptance doesn't necessarily mean the whole world, right? Generally, most of you right, that will be applying analytical chemistry somehow will be in a small, medium-sized, maybe a large company, but you'll be dealing with small, medium-sized groups of people. And, and you'll often be trying to analyze stuff and develop analysis methods um, that are, are, are novel, um, are, are better for your company, right? And so usually this widespread acceptance is associated with you convincing your coworkers that the method works, all right? And um, you're never gonna wanna stop trying to develop a method um, as an analytical chemist. You don't want to ever become the analyst. Uh, you want to continually be the analytical chemist and, and continue to improve upon your, your system. Um, it's, it's difficult to kind of take yourself out and not say, um, this is my baby, so I, I don't want it to, 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 be, to disappear, right? But you, you, you can't do that. You have to always expect that at some point, the analytical method will no longer be able to complete, compete and will be destroyed, all right? Very, very important um, uh, understanding to have that you're just going to make hay while the sun shines. You know, I don't know if you've heard that saying, make hay while the sun shines. Uh, you know, you use it while it works, but never be afraid of improving or, or getting rid of it because it's done. Does that make sense? No, oh, I think I got what you're trying to say. All right, very good. All right, and, and like anything else, um, you have to always take into account when you're uh, kind of thinking of or developing an analytical method, you have to take into account all the factors that are going to either cost um, or, or be, be negative, right? We call these, these, these factors trade-offs, trade-offs. And you create what are called trade-off curves where essentially you're thinking about um, the, the, the ramifications of the specific analytical assay that you have and whether it's good or bad in terms of um, uh, cost, in terms of time, in terms of waste, um, in terms of um, intellectual capability, necess the necessary amount of intellectual ability, right? If your method can't be run by somebody who is hired from high school, then it's, then it's not as good as one that can um, be run by anybody, right? If you need a PhD to do it, it's not gonna work, right? You need, you need to have uh, everybody be able to do it eventually. Here's an example of a, a method to quantify or measure the amount of zinc in a sample. Um, and, you know, original sample, boiling it in hot acid, eight to 10 hours, dilute it, digest for um, two to four hours with just the water there, uh, remove the lead and the sand that are in solids, right? Um, this will be in, so these will be in solutions, dilute it, add H2S, which is going to precipitate out your copper. So again, we're after the nickel. Um, then we have this, add ammonia. The ammonia uh, makes the solution 
basic, which precipitates out the iron, right? Uh, you can take this portion here and um, add, neutralize it with um, sodium bicarbonate and acetic acid, and then you can get ferric, ferric acetate, right, which is just iron acetate, basically. All right, and um, that will recover any extra nickel that might not have been recovered here, right? Anyway, you can see that the steps that are in this process um, are many, are many. And yeah, you could train somebody to do this, but it requires 58 hours there, right? So um, these types of, of methods, which, you know, are, are fine and sometimes all you got, uh, but this is the type of thing that you would look at this amount of time to run a sample and you have to have serious questions about its ability. Um, this costs a lot of money and the time is money. So even if these reagents were all cheap and it could sit in the container and it was very cheap to, to actually do this, just the sheer fact that you have to wait 58 hours for data, that is expensive. Um, all of these steps, result in many possible issues. One thing goes wrong, um, it'd be hard to, it might be hard to track down, right? So multiple steps is also um, a, a drawback, right? Um, a um, uh, a trade-off, right? All right, so in 1905, there was a discovery that this chemical here, um, selectively precipitated nickel and palladium, right? And it led to a, a significant change in our analytical method for this sort of analysis, right? Um, the resulting analysis here, right, much more simple. Uh, only 18 hours here, and again, most of it is um, this first step of um, trying to digest, right? So uh, it doesn't take much, a small change, to make a, a relatively large difference in, um, in, 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 a, in a system, in a business, you know, this, this type of thing can make huge, huge changes in the bottom line for a company, company, company that's trying to provide nickel, and that can lower the price of whatever nickel is dependent on, right? Which could be um, batteries, could be our electronic devices, right? So it is these small types of gains that make big differences for companies and ultimately make big differences for the world, okay? So maybe we would say that a better description of analytical chemistry is the science of inventing and applying concepts, principles, strategies for measuring the characteristics of chemical systems, all right? So it's, it's the developing of the assay that's more important than learning how to, how to run the assay, right? Some of these improvements mean smaller samples, on more complex samples, right? More specificity in your uh, um, assay, right? Less noise from surrounding um, analytes that aren't the one you're after. Uh, shorter time scale, present at lower concentration, all right? So these are ways to make large gains in um, as an analytical chemist. So then because of the gains that analytical chemists chemistry gives to science as a whole, you get a lot of different um, kind of small um, areas within chemistry, multiple uh, multidisciplinary areas um, that really are dependent on analytical chemistry, but because of specificity, um, they'll get completely different names, all right? And you know, it's really true that you know, you, if you look online to try to find, and I did this recently, try to get some ideas about how to do analytical chemistry online. You look online about uh, how to learn physical chemistry, there's videos out there. You look online about how to learn um, general chemistry, there's videos and classes. Uh, and organic chemistry, videos and classes as well. But you get into analytical chemistry and um, classes begin to disappear. Um, and explanations about analytical chemistry are often very specific from very specific uh, fields, people explaining their specific field. So uh, it's true that analytical chemistry is, is kind of broad and um, to have a class about it um, makes you think that it's distinct as organic is from general chemistry. 
but it's really just looking at the analytical process. All right, very good. So there we have our, our um, first section in our chapter one, right? Uh, oops, went back too far. So uh, looking into our second section, the analytical perspective, all right? Um, having noted that each area uh, brings a unique perspective to the study of chemistry, right? Let's ask a second question. What is the analytical perspective? Okay. Um, it's an approach to, to, to solving problems, right? Um, so, for example, when we identify the problem, um, where is the problem coming from? Uh, what type of information is needed? Right. And then um, after we identify uh, what kind of problem, wh where the problem is coming from and the type of information that's needed, uh, we need to establish the criteria that we decide will will result in, in an actual answer. Okay, and then we conduct an experiment and calibrate ourselves, find out how close we are to what we thought was possible, and then we have to kind of um, look at the results and make more decisions about what's actually possible. All right, and so this loop—I don't know—does it remind you of anything, Fred? Uh, not really. What are you thinking of? I'm thinking of the um, experimental process, right, where we have a hypothesis and we um, try to make decisions about what we think is going to occur, occur, right? Formulate an experiment, perform the experiment, gather the data, and then um, look at our results and perform a, or create a new hypothesis and allow that cycle to run enough time until we get a theory or a law, right? Or in this case, a solution for our problem. Okay. So we talked a little bit about the, the trade-offs of um, designing an analytical method, right? And um, these are some examples of some trade-offs that we have to kind of, we could think about. Um, if we're going to create a, a, a method, experimental process, procedure for identifying something quantitatively. We have to think about what is our required access, uh, precision, sensitivity, uh, the detection limit, right? Uh, the urgency with which the results are needed, uh, the cost of a single analysis, uh, the number of samples that we have to analyze and the amount of sample available for analysis, right? These are many, but not all of the things that might come into play when we're trying to make a decision about uh, the correct analytical method. All right. Um, accuracy and precision. What is the difference between accuracy and precision? Uh, I'm not sure I remember. All right. So let's talk about that in terms of uh, me as a golfer. Oh, I remember now. Oh, you remember the story of me as a golfer? Yeah, well, I think so. So, was I a good golfer? I think you were. What did I say? I think you said you always hit it in the hole. Well, I didn't say I always hit it in the hole. Those weren't my words. My words were, on average, I always hit it in the hole. Oh, well, what's the difference? Well, to always hit it in the hole means it always goes there. On average, though, if it always goes there, then my shot distribution, right, the distribution of all the shots is right in the hole. But the average isn't a representation of, of how good of a hitter I am, right? So this sort of measurement, um, just using the average to determine how well it, it uh, is predicting the actual value, um, is, is not um, precise enough. It's accurate. So if the average is the correct value, you know, you run standards, and if you get the correct value, then you can say your system is accurate. But to be effective, accuracy isn't always enough. Now, do you remember what you call it when my average is, or my cluster, my distribution, is clustered tightly around the, the correct value? No, I don't know. So this is accuracy, and this we say is precision or precise. 
All right. So uh, not just accurate, but precision. Accuracy is, is nice, but precision is also necessary. So identifying the required accuracy and precision. All right. Sensitivity respond or reply or um, is speaking to the relationship between the signal and the noise, the signal and the noise. So for example, if I'm measuring um, an amount of copper in a sample and I have some sort of a <coughs> system that's measuring copper and I see something like that and this is my peak here or the area under this curve represents the amount of copper, for example, um, this would be my relationship between signal and the signal, it would be right about here to there, right? And the thickness of this movement up and down in regions where there was no copper would be my, my noise. All right, so my signal to noise ratio has to have um, I, the desired signal to noise ratio is the question of um, sensitivity, sensitivity. Detection limit, right? An example of detection limit was um, if we bring back our um, standard curve for our copper sulfate. Now, do you remember Beer's law? You said you, you talked about Beer's law. Yeah, well, we used it. I guess I can't remember what it is. It relates absorbance to concentration, essentially, right? It says that as concentration increases, absorbance increases, or as absorbance increases, your concentration of your sample is larger, right? And that's Beer's Law. There are some other components in here, specifically that take into account the uh, path length and also the um, what we call the molar absorptivity or the extinction coefficient for the chemical. We always kind of fixed these by keeping the path length the same for every sample we put in. And also we fix the extinction coefficient because we're always using the exact same chemical, copper sulfate, right? And so we can kind of not think about those for now, all right? But absorbance is directly proportional to concentration here. Now, there was something else, though, about this lab or about Beer's Law in general that says that Beer's Law was only good if you were using dilute solutions. Do you remember this? Not necessarily. Well, let's think about that. Why would it be that um, absorption is only good when you're using dilute solutions? Uh, well, if it got too concentrated, I guess that it would... Mm, I don't know. Well, as you get more and more concentrated, what happens to the amount of light that passes through this specific wavelength that's your lambda max. As it gets more concentrated? Yeah. Less light passes through? That's right. As it gets more concentrated, less light passes through here. Your light source is only, it, it isn't infinite, right? There comes a point where you absorb all the light and no more light can pass through. And if no more light can pass through, and you can actually make your solution more concentrating, then there will come a point where this curve, and I'm going to redraw this curve on a, a fresh piece of paper so we can look at it better. Looking again at our absorption at lambda max versus our concentration, right? There will come a point where this curve will begin to plateau. And that's because once you've absorbed all the light that, that your little light bulb is trying to, to shine through the sample, you can still make the solution more concentrated, but your absorption won't increase anymore because there's no more light to absorb. You've absorbed it all. So this here is what we call our, uh, our range in which we can actually measure whatever it is our unknown is. So that range, that region from here, to here would be our detection limit, right? Um, if we have a, a zero as a blank, that's nice because then we can generally go down there as a detection limit. Um, 
and where our linearity begins to kind of fall off, we can um, uh, call our detection limit. Now, some people get into a dangerous practice of saying, well, you know, you wanted to fit a y equals mx plus b, a linear curve there, and use that equation to relate concentration, of absorbance to concentration. What if instead of uh, doing a linear curve, what if I chose instead to use a quadratic formula, right? And it's true. I can get a, a different formula in Excel or from whatever software I have that will fit this very well and give me a, a um, y equals x squared plus 3, 5x minus 23, you know, some, some, maybe this has to be cubed and this has to be squared and this has to be to the x plus 16. You know, whatever it is, you can get an equation that fits there, but that no longer indicates that we can really predict the differences along these lines. Okay. Um, we're going to have a little conversation here about uh, error in our um, standard, in a standard curve like this. All right. Let's do that really quick so that we can see why just simply choosing a a quadratic or some other equation to fit is not necessarily a good idea. Again, here we can look at our uh, lambda max absorbance, sorry, at lambda max versus the concentration of our analyte. And that's a, a word that we're going to introduce gradually or eventually. But I'll tell you right now that the analyte is the chemical that we're generally looking to, de to determine its concentration or uh, quantitatively measure. All right. So if I have lambda max versus the concentration here, and I have run some standards so that I get a standard curve with a y equals mx plus b. All right. Now let's say that I have my uh, spectrophotometer here, right? And I'm measuring it, and I'm, you know, this is the display on my, whoops, on, on my computer screen, right? And every once in a while, I bump this maybe just a little bit, and I see that the absorbance shifts just a little bit. That error, random error, it could shift up or down, depending on how I kind of bumped it, right? Um, and that, that, that shift is, you know, slight changes in the path length, right? That, that cuvette doesn't fit just perfectly in there. So when it shifts either one way or the other, the absorbance can go up or down because of that, because the path length is changing, so there's more chemical in the way of the light beam. Well, um, that makes the measurement that you put into this equation, again, there's an e equation there, that makes this measurement have an, an error associated with it. All right? Now that error, so you say the absorbance was actually somewhere in this region now, not just that value, that error will propagate along this line and you'll end up having a range of concentration that the actual value might be based on that error. And the propagation here, if this slope here of this equation m here equals 1, then the propagation of the error or the error here will be propagated to have uh, the same amount of error in your concentration. But if we have a, a, a different slope. So for example, if our equation is less sensitive because there's only slight variations in given regions, right? then first of all, our measurement is not going to be the same location, right? One, two, three. Our measurement will be right about here now because um, uh, we have, we're measuring, uh, we have a different relationship now. So um, if we use a different equation, we're going to have a different slope. And when we look at how the air propagates here, I didn't draw the, that perfectly straight, but you can see that because this slope is more shallow, the resulting propagation of air is much larger. And so the range of the actual possible value from this measurement is much larger. 
So this occurs in, in a case where you have um, small deviations over large range. All right, that, that's uh, a situation where that sort of, this sort of a scenario occurs. And it's problematic for a standard curve if your standard curve is shallow. That's an indication that your, your system is not going to have great sensitivity. Okay. All right. Good. Um, and then these other parameters, right? How urgent the results are needed, the cost of a single analysis, number of samples to analyze, the amount of uh, analyte available, all are very important. Um, we're not going to delve too much into those because, well, maybe later, but they're more specific to um, the, the problem at hand, right? Uh, now, th there's a nice paragraph here, which I, which I would read if I were you, um, that kind of talks about the, um, uh, the interaction that you have with other um, fields of, of chemistry, other fields, not just, sorry, not of chemistry, but other fields of, of, of interest, right? So people in general, no matter what system they're trying to look at or what company they're trying to um, work for, will always benefit from the help of an analytical chemist. And you'll find that analytical chemists are working in very strange places because of the contribution that they can make to almost anything. Okay. You also have to think about how to collect, store, prepare samples, um, and whether chemical or physical interfaces will affect the analysis. All right. We have some analysis which we call destructive analysis, right? A destructive analysis is one that will consume all of your um, material as you perform the analysis. Uh, a non-destructive analysis is great, right? Non-destructive analysis, you don't destroy your material. You can perform the analysis. You can leave it on the shelf for five months and then perform the analysis again on the sample and make sure your, your, your system works. All right. What's an example of a, a destructive analysis? Well, um, some instrumentation has to actually remove the, the sample and kind of burn it or suck it up into the system, right? Um, uh, ICP is an example of a chemical analysis, which we'll talk about and um, which is used frequently. It, it essentially is a spectrophotometer but to get it to uh, kind of absorb the energy, it's uh, atomized and vaporized in, in a high temperature plasma, okay? Inductively coupled plasma spectroscopy, ICP, okay? So um, that will take, you know, between three and 10 milliliters for every sample that you run. Um, what do you think was our example of um, using... Um, that we used in Chem 105, was this destructive or non-destructive? Um, it was kind of destructive because you had to make dilutions. That's true. That's true. It was kind of destructive because you had to make those dilutions, so you were taking some of your sample. But in general, spectroscopy like this would be considered a, a non-destructive uh, means. Uh, again, spectroscopy like this meaning just shining light through it. You can retrieve the sample you know, maybe heat it up gently or let the, the solution evaporate to reconcentrate if you needed to. Okay, good. But it can't be underestimated or understated how important it is to take into account um, the collection, storage, uh, and storage methods um, of your samples, right? Um, because, you know, one example is when we go to the beach and we get some water to find out how much calcium is in that water, right? Um, this is a lab that we would typically do in analytical chemistry. Well, when you do that, um, you take water from the beach, just set it on the counter, the, a couple of things can occur. Can you think of anything that might occur if you just set ocean water on the counter? Will, will the salt come to the bottom? Will it settle? All right. Usually there's not a whole lot of settling that occurs simply by sitting and the salt or the material that's in there won't settle necessarily. But you do begin to see kind of um, floaties, if you will, right? A little precipitate powder occurring. Um, and 
another thing that happens is it begins to smell really bad. Oh, yeah. Well, what's that mean? Well, any smell, strong smell, is generally associated with bacterial growth, right? And so once you get bacterial growth, you are now um, decreasing the homogeneity of your sample. It's not creating or destroying inorganic material, like you're not creating or destroying calcium, but you're definitely creating or destroying organic material, right? That growth of uh, bio biological life, right, is changing the organic species that are there, and the biological species are changing as well. So if we store that in a fridge, generally we see that um, that gives us enough time to get consistent measurements over the time frame of a, of a couple weeks that we might want to to have the sample available to run the lab. All right, so just an example there. All right, um, validating a analysis, validating an analysis. Validation is essentially showing that your analysis works for the sample that you're trying to run it against. Um, and again, this, this, all the different parameters associated with whatever the, the company, the lab that um, is taking these samples, all their parameters that are important to them need to be taken into account. So simply because one validation technique is good at one company doesn't mean that it's going to be helpful at, at another. Okay. Um, uh, let's see here. Okay, good. So what I want you guys to do now is I want you to go and uh, read this article here. All right. Um, <clears throat> now, when you read it, um, think about these questions as you read them. All right. And try to, um, you're going to write the answers to these questions. You're going to kind of journal it and orally express it in a video that you're going to create for me. All right. Um, so this is something that we're going to try to do frequently. So when it comes time for you to do this, um, you know, you're going to want to remember how you do it. Hopefully it's, it's not that big of a deal. You need to have some sort of a webcam or you can just use your camera if you need to. We want to be able to hear the sound well. All right. And we don't want to be able to um, have a, enough stability so it's not doesn't make you sick to watch it sort of thing. <laughs> Um, so try to make it a good video, <clears throat> good enough. Uh, try to answer these questions. And then um, don't get too hung up on um, understanding this, the exact methods that are, are being used. Um, so here, let me look, bring up the, the article here. Um, within the experimental section, you can read through it and try to understand a little bit what's going on. Um, but don't get hung up on stuff you don't understand. I, I know that's hard to kind of understand at this point, but I mean, especially when you maybe you haven't read a lot of papers, but let me teach you a little bit about what happens or what we should probably be doing when we read a paper. We're drawn to the paper because of a search result generally that has something to do with the, the title. So hopefully, we have a general understanding of um, what's going on, but not necessarily. Um, the abstract is something that we're generally going to read next after we're, we're familiarize ourselves because of our search, usually with the title. The abstract is important, and when you write an abstract, that's important as well. You've hopefully had some practice writing abstracts and in general chemistry. Uh, we might have a little bit of um, practice in this class. Um, but within the abstract, hopefully there is information that will help you get a, a rough idea of what's going on. Surely there's stuff that you're not going to understand within the abstract, but that's okay. After you read the abstract, um, the introduction should be the tool to get you from a position of, and, and you can think about this when you end up writing your own scientific works. The introduction should be the vehicle to get somebody who doesn't know anything about it, about your topic, and, and funnel them, we think of it as a funnel, very broad to getting very, very point, funnel them into the specifics of why you performed this specific set of experiments. 
okay? So if somebody doesn't know what's going on, generally the app or the, the introduction here will get them closer to understanding. Usually in your life, you're going to understand what's going on and you read through the abstract simply to get a, a taste of what happened, why it happened, how it happened, um, and some important resulting values there. Okay, so generally you want to get some important resulting numbers in your abstract. I don't see that here, but um, it doesn't always be the case, but it's, it's, it's pretty important. The experimental section you can read, and it depends on your perspective, but most likely you won't be able to understand everything that's going on and or why they're doing what they've chosen to do. That takes more of a understanding, uh, uh, special understanding of what, what the research is about, right? So if you're coming from the perspective that you are now as a student, you probably will understand very little in terms of the, um, <clears throat> the experimental section. But don't worry about that. And that's an important um, tip for learning as a student and moving forward. You want to make sure you can weigh the concern about not understanding certain aspects, recognize that there's a weakness there and that you want to improve upon it, but don't let that stop you from trying to gather and um, understand. Do you ever do jigsaw puzzles? Uh, not much. Jigsaw puzzles are a good example of this. Um, don't get stuck. You don't get stuck on one section just because you can't figure it out. You can approach the problem from many different directions in a jigsaw puzzle, and then gradually you minimize um, the possibilities and you increase the likelihood of you being able to see what's going on. Okay? So, read through this. Um, again, another area that should hopefully tie things all together, if, if from a writer or a reader's perspective, is the conclusion. So when you're in a situation where you don't understand anything that's going on, usually the introduction and the conclusion can help you out. All right. When you're coming from a perspective where you know a lot about this topic, the abstract, the figure and the figure caption, and the results section are generally where you're going to spend most of your time. All right. So let's try to read it and let's try to um, answer the questions that are being kind of presented to us in, whoops, in this right here, these uh, six different questions, okay? And then let's also um, create a video in which we are uh, stating kind of our answers to these questions or our understanding of what's going on. Nobody's going to see these videos except for me to start off with, but gradually we want to hopefully get these videos better so that we're comfortable letting other people uh, look at them as well, okay? All right, good. We went through uh, some introductory stuff, and we also uh, have a, a little assignment for us. Great.